Go ahead, Mike. Okay, hello, everybody. So we're going to go over the CoLS. We're going to go over some new published so those of you that are on a cell phone, can you mute your cell phone, please? Thank you. Okay, so we're going to go over, gonna go over the recently published papers on competitive information. You all should have received a link to all of this material that's in Dropbox. And if you did, just reach out to your regional manager. They can make sure that you get this information. Okay, here we go. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to go over this so first. Over this first. It's entitled, entitled Patient-Based Decision for Resuming Activity After ACL Reconstruction. It's a single center experience. So it was, so it was uh, recently published in 2016. It's a single center. single center retrospective clinical study with institutional ethical committee approval. So that means it has IRB approval. It's based, on it's based on 72 patients who had a primary ACL reconstruction that were practicing recreational or professional sports prior to the ACL reconstruction. The mean age of 18 to 31 years old, um, ranging, ranging from 14, as young as 14, to as old as 56 years old. The surgical technique is COLAP. Europe is known as the CLS system, which consists, consists of four to five boot bands of the semi tendinosis with a minimum diameter of nine millimeters. Mean graph length is 50 millimeters, it's pre tension to 500 meters per second. And the graph plate, this thing is using, uh, it was used navigation, navigational control provided by um, Escalop using their ortho pilot system. So, so use the path uh, surgical navigation. The center of the field tunnel is at 45% of the AP distance, 45% of the medial lateral dimension, center of the tunnel, tunnel is at 75% of the AP dimension along the Blumen stat line. The Blumen stat line is this orange line here that kind of reflects the, the roof of the intercondylar notch. You can, uh, you can uh, click on that Blumen fat line on the hyperlink and you can get more detailed information there. And then it's 25% of the proximal distal dimension, again, perpendicular to the Blumen fat line. So basically, here's the perpendicular dimension. And it's kind of giving you a precise location for the femoral tunnel. Okay, so post op, the patients, they were medicated until so they were painless which means they had a visual analog scale value of less than or equal to three. They were on NSAIDs, non anti-inflammatory, uh, for five days. These patients, those that were out of meniscal repair, were immediate full weight bearing without crushes. Those with the meniscal repair were, had protected weight bearing with crutches for four weeks. No bracing, unrestricted knee motion. And then the, this is the key of the whole paper. Their return to sport activity and work was self-determined. It was not determined by the doctor. It was self-determined by the patient. Follow-up was done at six weeks, three months, six months, and one year in the physician's office. So now we're going to report on the results of 72 patients. Mean follow-up, just shy of four and a half years, uh, with as little as one and a half year follow-up, with a max of seven years of follow-up. So again, if you don't know what any of these terms mean, just click on the hyperlink. So the Tegner activity score, it's based on 10. You might remember that a, a score of six or seven is a really good score with civic sports. So pre-op, our Tegner score was 6.8. Post-op, it's six. That's a good score. And uh, it's interesting that 71% of the patients return to their pre-op score. It was statistically significant, the Tegner score between their pre-op value and their post-op value. You can say that with 99.9% .9 confidence. The mean by some functional score, so again, if you want to click on the hyperlink and see what that is, it's a scoring system based on 100 points max. Pre-op, the score was just shy of 60, and post-op, the score improved to just over 91. Again, that was statistically significant. 
And then there's the, the CRU score, which is a mean injury and osteoarthritis outcome score. It's based on 100 points. Pre-op, the score was 43.9. Post-op, it improved to just shy of 88. Again, it was um, statistically significant, 98%. So here's another uh, scoring system. It's the IKDC score. It's one that we've talked about in the past. It's a subjective scoring system based on 100 points. And um, pre-op, the score was 37. It improved to just over 94. And what you need to know here is that if you look at the normal American population of healthy individuals aged 25 to 34, they're IKDC score is 94. So that's a healthy population of Americans of age 25 to 34. So the point being, we have restored these patients back to what is considered a healthy population of an age group 25 to 34. It was statistically significant. If we use the objective scoring system, 60% of the patients uh, pre-op or normal or near normal. Post-op, that improved to 88%, so that's a tremendous improvement. If we look at the mean differential actually, so what that means is you look at the AP drawer of the healthy knee, and then you look at the AP drawer of the operative knee, and you want that difference to be less than 3 millimeters. So if a healthy knee drawers 5 millimeters, and the operative knee drawers four millimeters, the differential there is one, and that's an excellent result. So pre-op, differential axially was 5.4. Post-op, the differential axially was reduced to 2.2. So 92% of the patients returned to any type of sporting activity. And um, that, that's really good, because if you look at what's been published in the literature, Typically, the mean delay is 6 to 12 months. Here, in our study, the mean delay was less than that, so better than what's been published in the literature. Four months, to, uh, the mean of four months delay to return to running, six months to return to pivot sports like skiing, tennis, gymnastics, just a little over six months uh, for contact sports like football, rugby, judo. 71% of the patients returned to their pre-injury sports activity. That's a fantastic result. And compare that result to what's been published in the literature on meta-analysis, where only 63% to 75% of patients returned to their pre-injury sports activity. So we're right there, if not better than other studies. 82% of patients were able to perform competitive sports activity after a mean delay of 7.1 months. Compare that to what's been published in the literature on meta-analysis of 44% of patients who can return to competitive sports in that time frame. So that's a huge improvement. If we look at our retail rate, it was 6%, and it occurred after a significant e knee injury. So we had four patients that had a retail. One of them was after alpine skiing, and three of them were after a soccer injury. <laughs> Compared to what's been reported in the literature, of a retail rate of 5% to 13%. So we're at the bottom end of what's reported in the literature. And that literature, I'm giving you the references for that. So what's the take home message of this paper? I'll just read it to you. Patient based decision making to return to work and sport is possible without compromising functional outcome and occurs faster than what has been reported in the literature. With the COLS system, the mean IKDC score is the same as for a healthy, young patient population, and the rate of retail is less than what is reported in the literature for ACL reconstruction. Big tank home message. Okay, let's look at this next paper that talks about the tightrope system with minimum of 12 month follow up. Now, here, the tightrope system is being used on both the femoral and tibial side. I can sum up this entire paper by looking at this blue column, which is entitled Brezzi et al. 2016. And what's nice about looking at this table is you can compare the results in this article 
to the four yellow columns, which are the published results on the CoLS system, four papers. You look, can look at three published series on the Endo button, which is three columns in green, and then our benchmark, which is um, BTD and hamstring. And one of the best benchmarks here is the Danish registry. So let's look at the uh, Bressy paper. It's on 35 patients. Average age of these patients is 28 years old. The follow-up, uh, the mean is just shy of 20 months, ranging from one year to a little over three years. And let's look at the retail rate. It's 2.9%. But more importantly, let's look at the revision rate. 14% revision rate. That's higher than anybody else has ever reported in the literature. If we look at the IKDC scores on the Brezzi results, they're not that good. Uh, just shy of 72 points. Compare that to the yellow column, 92 points by Robert et al. on the CoLS system, 94.2 points uh, reported by Jenny. If we look at um, the objective scoring system, uh, the A and B, which is no A is normal and B is near normal, so only 43% of the patients return to normal or near normal. Let's compare that to the CoLS, where Robert et al. reported 74% and Jenny et al. reported 88%. Huge difference. And the lysome functional score on the Brezzi results are, again, very poor just shy of 80 points. Let's compare that to the CoLS. 94 points by Robert, 95 points by Cassard et al., 91 points by Jenny et al. And then if we look at the Tegner scoring system, well, again, uh, Reggie didn't even report that. Ours are in the 60s. And then the differential laxity. So the mean is 2.8. That's pretty good, but what isn't good is the fact that 20% of the patients, no, 46% of the patients had a differential laxity of three millimeters or more. That's horrible. And compare that to ours. So let's look at the Marchand results. Our uh, average is 1.5, 1.6, and you can see the range there. And if we look at residual laxity, we have 54% of the patients had residual laxity greater than three millimeters. We know in the literature that anything greater than three millimeters is considered a clinical failure. So compare 54, sorry, compare 46% to our results of 16%, 0%, or 18%. So I think this is a pretty compelling published paper that the tightrope when used on both sides, doesn't give good results. Conclusion from this paper was uh, the, these authors will no longer use tightrope on both sides. I think it's these kinds of results that explain why the tightrope system is used on the femoral side and then uh, a regular fixation screw is used on the tibial side. So the tightrope system is the suspension system and uh, with suspension on both the femur and the tibia, it's too much suspension, you get too much residual laxity, you get too much tunnel widening and lengthening of the reconstruction. So revision rates are important, retail rates are important. So in this paper, the rate of revision for the tightrope was 14.2%. Um, it was revisions for meniscus tears due to a lack of stability following ACL reconstruction. So if you don't have a good stable ACL reconstruction, it can uh, translate into um, other problems that occur down the line. And in this particular series, those other problems were subsequent meniscal tears. So what is our retail rate on the CoLS system? Well, Robert et al. Report, reported 0% on 74 patients with uh, two-year follow-up. Cassart et al. reported uh, a 7.1 percent. So that sounds like a big number, but it was actually only two patients out of 28. One was 
One was for graph necrosis, and one was because of a soccer collision. If we look at the Marchand et al. study on 88 patients, 0% retear. And then finally, if we look at the Jenny uh, results on 72 patients, the retear rate was 6%. So that's four patients out of 72, and they were all retairs for significant sports injury or alpine skiing or soccer. We, we covered that paper first in this webinar. So what we should do now is pool all of those four studies. If we pool those four studies, we have 262 patients. And out of those 262 patients, only six patients had a retail. So that's a combined pooled retail rate of 2.3%. Let's compare that to what's been published in the Danish Registry or by Wright et al. in 2007 or again by the same authors in 2011 or by Mayer in 2012. So in those studies, the retail rate ranges 3% to 9%. So what can you conclude? you can conclude that our retail rate is less than what, other, what is reported for other systems in the market. That's a huge selling advantage. Okay, let's move into a competitive review. Let's look at the tightrope system here. So depicted in the bottom right-hand corner, so the tightrope system by Arthrex, let's look at the clinical complications. So as a result of this button that rests on the cortex, you have irritation of the iliotibial band causing lateral knee pain. That's been reported by Kawaguchi. You sometimes need to use an arthroscope to confirm proper deployment of the button and proper position of the button. When used on both the femur and the tibia, the clinical results are poor. We just talked about the Dredzi results with 14.2% revision rates, 2.9% retear rates and 46% of the patients with a differential laxity of greater than 3 millimeters, meaning a um, clinical failure. There's a low IKDC score. If you look at the work published by Schertz et al., the retail rate was even higher, just shy of 13%. So now let's look, look at some of the biomechanical testing complications with the pipe rope system. If you look at the published work by the Gucci in 2016, total elongation of the construct of four millimeters with very low load and not very many cycles. So when I say very low load, uh, if you look at normal loads during early rehab, those loads range between 450 to 500 newtons. So in this biomechanical study, they didn't even, didn't even use loads that are normal in a normal rehab. Loads during level walking, 303 newtons. Going downhill, 445 newtons. Uh, a normal person experiences 6,000 6, uh, cycles per day. So in this study, they did very low loads and only a third of a day. And after that, the graph stretched 4 millimeters, so a clinical failure. Similar results reported by, actually even worse results reported by Barra total elongation of just over 13 millimeters. Again, very low loads and incredibly uh, low number of cycles before that catastrophic elongation occurred. And it, 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 it took less than 2,000 cycles to get to a clinical failure of three millimeters. Weak link in the system is a breakage near uh, of the suspension system near the button. So the suspension system is the weak link. The weak link in the coalesce system is the graft, not the fixation system. Similar results reported by Mayer et al. And their conclusion was you can't use a tightrope suspension system on the femur and the tibia. Uh, you'll have to use an interference screw on at least one side of the joint. And still with that, you still get six millimeters of elongation at low cycles, low loads. So let's look at the take-home message. Unable to prevent suture slippage and loop, loop lengthening at low loads and cycles that would normally occur on a daily basis. The construct weak link is typically the fixation point until graft osseointegration occurs. 
slippage or lengthening of the construct leads to micromotion at the intraarticular aperture, tunnel widening, impaired healing, loss of tension, and increased laxity. Let's look at the toggle lock system. It's not so different than the tightrope depicted in the bottom right hand corner. We can look at results by Barrow et al. And by now you should be getting a feel that results, anything over three millimeters, is in the literature considered a clinical failure. So once again, we're here showing a clinical failure at very low loads and very low cycles. It took uh, just over 2,000 cycles to reach that point of a clinical failure. Breakage, uh, the weak link system here is again the suspension mechanism. Again, results reported by Johnson et al. Again, it's a clinical failure with a mean of just under 3.7 millimeters. Again, it's very low loads, very low cycles. Similar results, results reported by Petri, by Connor, on and on. So now let's look at the endo button uh, product. Similar to the toggle lock, it's by Smith and Nephew. Let's look at the clinical complications there. Tunnel widening has been reported. We can look at the results by Kowalski, published in 2009 a 58% increase in the femoral tunnel diameter at four years. So a not a good indication of intra-articular aperture healing. We look at the results reported by Silva et al. in 2010, 30% increase in tunnel widening in the middle of the femoral tunnel, 15% at the intra-articular aperture. And similar to the tightrope, Arthroscopic confirmation of the button deployment is oftentimes necessary. If we look at some of the complications from the biomechanical testing, similar results. So we've looked at these results on the tightrope and the um, toggle lock that Barrow reported. He also reported uh, similar results on the endo button. So these results in the endo button biomechanically are actually pretty good, much less than three millimeters. Weak link is the suspension system. If you look at Johnson, he reported pretty good results biomechanically, but again, these are low loads, low cycles. Petri also reported pretty good results, but keep in mind they're low cycles, low loads. And Connor reported not so great results. It's a clinical failure, the means over three millimeters, and it's low cycles, low loads. I want to uh, make known to you that we now have a new uh, couple of options for aiming devices. So I've circled them here. On the femur, we have an anterior lateral hook and an offset hook. So the anterior lateral hook allows us now to more easily target the tightrope customer. I'll explain that in a second. On the tibia system, we now have a point to elbow. So this is probably more common, what we, what we have been doing to this time, up to this time, is point to point. Um, just be aware that the components are not interchangeable, so if you're going to use these new aiming devices, you have to use this new blue handle, and you have to use this new sleeve. Okay, so what is the significance of these new aiming devices? It, it all has to do with where you position your working portal and where you position your viewing portal. So you, you probably should be aware that with the CoLS system, the working portal where we insert all of our instruments, where we insert our graft, uh, is placed anterior medial, medial 